Howdy everybody. Now I can't tell you not to burn this or rip this or trade this or put this on the internet, but if you do get a copy of this disc for free, I can tell you to please donate some money to a charity. Whatever this disc is worth to you, donate that amount to a charity. Might I suggest this one? And here's another couple of good ones too. Hi everybody, I'm Gene Hoagland and welcome to my very first drumming DVD. Hopefully this is going to be informative, educational, and entertaining. What I'm going to be doing with this DVD is taking you inside my head as I play, let the minutiae of my playing, what makes me, me, as a drummer. I'm going to be showing you the tips, tricks, techniques, cheats that I use that allow me to be me, let me do what I do. I'm going to be featuring tons from my new band Mechanism. It's pretty technical stuff, definitely shows off a lot that I can do. 
as well as some of the more non-metal stuff that I've done recently. You know, it's not all about the hauling metal. So there's gonna be tons of double bass on this and tons of groove and taste. So let's get cracking. Hell. Mechanism, my new band. I love this stuff. I'm really into this band. This, all the material on this is off our as yet to be released album. And it's not an instrumental album. There's lots of vocals on it, but I just kept the vocals off this for purposes of, you know, just showing the drums. Showing a little bit of the uh, ghost notes that I like to do right about here. Trying to lock them up with the kicks a little bit. If you'll notice, I'm playing with the leg weights on, which I, I did most of this DVD with the leg weights on, just because it was pretty comfortable to do. I've often said about this mechanism stuff is that it's taught me three different ways to count to 19. You know, I count a lot in this band, I, more so than in any other project I work with because there's a lot of crazy tempos and, and, and meter changes and, and stuff like that, tempo changes, so I do a lot of counting in this. This is a pretty good example of me doing some grindy blast beat here. Keeping the double basses rolling through the whole thing. And a lot of you that know my playing know that I don't usually set up that china over there, but for this song, it works. Oh, it's quite a challenge trying to play to something with no click. I'm just playing directly to pre-recorded guitar tracks. No click, no anything to kind of tell you where it goes. I always love playing two rides, two chinas when I can. Here's an example of some of those ghost notes coming up. The original song doesn't have this big uh, crashy drum solo to it. I just figured I'd kind of freak out here just a little bit and throw the drums down the stairs for you. I always like those old school metal songs where they uh, have a big drum solo at the very end. It starts off really slow and then starts cooking. When I play, I've got a drum carpet that uh, you know my my erstwhile dr drum tech Brian Seeley put together for me on, on one of these recent tours, and it's something that I suggest everybody try. You know, you you it's it makes your setup really easy, especially if you have a big kit. 
And since Brian Seely does not always get to be my drum tech, I've got, you know, like five different drum techs right now. And if I've got a drum carpet with everything mapped out on it, it's just a little map, you know, you're seeing what I'm doing here. I'm poking around and showing you some, you know, what goes where. Drum carpets are just good to have, you know, they're, they're a good thing to, you know, your kit is always set up the way you want. Everything just kind of fits into its own little puzzle piece. And if you have to use a new tech or you're having a rush to get your gear set up, you know, nobody ever sets up your drums the way you want unless you're sitting there with them. And with the drum carpet, hell, it's all just kind of mapped out there for you. So, you know, you could have two trained monkeys put your kit together and it's going to work out just fine if, if you use a drum carpet where you've delineated where things go. About 10 or 15 minutes before I go on stage, I do a quick little warm-up routine. I'm going to take you through, through most of it here. What I do is I start off by stretching. And this is a really good stretch for your wrists. And what you do is you keep your pinkies together and you crank it one way. And this isn't really easy to do at first. I remember when I first tried this, I was like, holy crap, I can't do this. So you crank, it's like you crank your left hand in first, right through there, crank it back out. And then you crank your right hand in. And that's not super easy. And then the next thing I do this is an exercise that my good buddy Big Al Packmeyer taught me 12 years ago when I was playing with death and it's really simple and it's really cool and it makes it just so you can just start playing immediately. What you do is you take your arm, keep it straight, and you start by just twisting, pulling your fingers back. Don't do it too hard at first because you might end up uh, kind of hurting yourself. It's a series of three by the way. Start it with number one, this is number one. Number two, crank it down. Pull it, you pull all your fingers. You feel that right there, totally feel that. Then number three, flip it upside down. Crank it back like that. You totally feel it right here too. That's one hand. Do the other hand, get your thumbs in there. Number one is you crank it all back. Number two, it's down. Pull it, again, you feel that all up there. Boom, flip it upside down for number three. Keep your arm straight. Hell yeah, I'm ready to play. Usually I just start doing some just simple rudiments just to, just to get cracking, you know, just kind of break the adhesions of not playing for a while. And you can start by doing double strokes. Really simple. I just usually start just freaking out really, you know. I like using the whole pad when I play, you know, I like... Usually my pad bounces around tons, I never tape it down or anything like that. I like to use big sticks when I warm up. Uh, I used to play with like big marching, marching drum sticks and uh, I kind of switched over after the Death Individual Thought Patterns album. I did those with big, huge sticks, and I just felt like there wasn't a lot of taste or feel. It definitely sounded like a bull in a china shop trying to do tasty stuff. So I only use them to warm up. Anybody who's ever followed my career knows that I, I have warmed up with giant leg bones. I have used three-pound steel sticks. Uh, I'll use anything. I've had my same ankle weights. I've worn on my wrist as I warm up. Anything to just kind of get that little cheating edge to, to make the actual sticks lighter. So I like using big old warm-up sticks. This is a good little exercise to kind of work your stamina for like blast beats or whatever. I just start doing singles. I watched a guy do this at a clinic when I was in Holland in 1993. I saw this guy doing this and I thought it was really cool because I couldn't do it. It was just this. That's all it is. You can keep it going as long as you want, you know, try to get it as long as you can go, you know. Like I can do this all day long. Like I'll just sit here, you know, kick back, check your watch out, use the phone, call mom, tell her you love her, call your girlfriend, 
Tell her to make some dinner. Try to get it going as fast as you can, you know. Try doing it together. That just starts getting your unison together, you know? It's like, if you're gonna be playing extreme metal, there's a lot of blast beats involved, so I mean, so doing something like that with big old sticks is really good. You could do all sorts of different accents, you know, like accent the one, accent the two, or whatever that is. I don't know if that's accenting the two, but it's something cool. And then just freak out a little bit. I'll get into a little bit later how I pretty much taught myself all my own rudiments. I've never learned from a book, you know, to start off, like, you, you know, if you can read music and if you can write your own music, you're already a way better drummer than I am because I don't do any of that. I just, that's where I keep it. I don't know if you can see this on camera, but while I'm doing this, I'm starting to warm up my legs as well. And if you've seen the making of Alien, uh, I explained on that the Dom Famularo technique that I use. And show you what I do for my legs. It's a really simple little, little exercise. And as I explained before, it's kind of retarded looking, but it's really effective. And while I'm wearing the leg weights, this is great to get your legs together. Do this exercise. It looks kind of foolish, but it's really effective to kind of break all the adhesions. You know, you kind of stretch out your feet, stretch them to the, to the outsides, get them to the insides, and you just kind of dance around like that. Like, I'm a really lazy drummer, like believe it or not. I like making everything really easy. So when I have to play long hauling, stamina filled passages, like, I'll wear leg weights up until I have to play that part. Like, for instance, when I was on stage with Strapping a couple years ago, we had a song called Shitstorm. That was the last song in the set. And if you're familiar with that song, it's really hauling double bass, and it's really gross. So I would play with the leg weights on for the whole set. I would take them off right before Shitstorm, and then you just fly. Everything's really easy. Like, the leg weights, like I say, they really help your, your speed, your stamina, your power, most importantly, your control. Wearing the leg weights is really good. When we were on tour on the Sounds of the Underground in 2005, we had a really short set. We were playing a festival type thing, and uh, I would be playing, I just played the whole set with the leg weights on. And I, I would always have this like pile of drummers from all the other bands behind me going, What an asshole! He does it with leg weights too? And it's like, Yeah, just kind of being a jerk, you know, so. But leg weights are really good. You take the leg weights off, you fly. When I first joined strapping, I wasn't much of a blast beating drummer. Um, really about the only blast beat I had ever played in my entire life was when I was on stage with Death in 1993. We were doing a festival tour in Europe and it was with Carcass and Cannibal Corpse, two highly blasty bands. And I remember, like for all you YouTubers out there, you could probably find my first blast beat on YouTube because it was filmed for MTV Europe for this big old special they were doing on death and there's a version of pull the plug by death and you'll see chris barnes from cannibal corpse is singing background with us and just off the top of my head i was like wow this is going to be cool i'm gonna try a blast beat right here i didn't know what i was doing so i blasted the hell out of this one part and i get off stage and i i mentioned to jeff from carcass who's a really sardonic motherfucker uh i was like hey man did you catch my blast beat he's like yeah, I caught your blast beat. Tell you what, leave the blasting to us. I was like, no! Oh! Okay, so I gotta improve that. So Byron Stroud from Strapping, he taught me this old hockey exercise that he used to use. 
and it's a really good one for uh, for getting your wrists together. So what you do is you take like this is a 10 pound weight. You can start with a 10 pound weight. I suggest probably like an eight pound weight or something, you know, a little lighter. But what you do is you just grip it at the end of your fingertips and you just do a, just do curls with your fingertip. Old hockey exercise, and if you've ever seen Byron's wrists, he has tree trunks for wrists, and I would never want to get smashed in the face by Byron. Anybody out there who has been smashed in the face by Byron, you're probably not out there anymore. So you start by doing that, flip it over, and you do curls like that. And this ain't really easy right now because I haven't really practiced this in a while, but this is a good way to get your wrists together. Yeah, I'm way easier with the right hand. Do it like that, do it like that. My hands are a little sweaty right now, so it's hard to grip, but you get the basic gist. That's, this goes along with the leg weights. I've really never cared to make it my forte to be the most technical drummer around. Uh, a lot of the old stuff with death was kind of technical. Some of the stuff I'll be showing you on this gets a little technical, but I've been way more involved with like taste and feel and just making things sound sweet. I love rhythm, I love drums, and there's so much inside the parameter of metal that, you know, when I grew up listening to double bass drummers like Dean Castronovo, Tommy Aldridge, Cozy Powell, like Tommy Aldridge especially, he's a really tasty drummer, Dean Castronovo, an extremely tasty drummer. He was way more about taste and feel than being the fastest guy, but he had great kicks, you know, he was, he was a great double bass drummer. So I've always wanted to bring feel, taste to the whole thing. Being the fastest in the world, that's never, that's never meant much to me. Um, I like being my own drummer. I like having my own style. I knew when I was growing up listening to Tommy Aldridge and all those guys, I, you know, Rob Reiner from Anvil, Rob Wacko Hunter from Raven, those guys were all my idols when I was growing up. From Neil Peart to Mark Craney to Sonny Emery to Terry Bozio, all these guys, I figured if I followed that stuff and I just learned drums through osmosis, I'm going to develop my own style over the course of history, I guess, you know, and hopefully I have. So, tell you what, I'm going to jump on the kit here, my big badass Super Pearl SRX drum set, and I'm going to show you the rest of this warm up stuff. Okay, so now we're on the kit. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to do some double strokes on the hands while I do single strokes on the kicks. Like single stroke, I guess they're uh, 16th notes, doing like 30 second notes on the hands. It's a really good exercise just to get you started warming up. You know, I'm still warming up here. So here we go. I'm just going to give it a crack here. The reason behind this exercise is to get your left tight with your right and uh, you know, your, your, your left upper with your left lower and your right as well. A good exercise is to speed up and slow down both your hands, doing the double strokes, and your feet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of slowly, gradually speed it up, slow it down a little bit, speed it up, you know, get it up there and just let it wave around and let yourself play with, with yourself. Play with yourself. <laughs> um, play with yourself as you get your control together with the upper and the lower. So I'm going to start it off again. Here we go. rocking. I'm pretty warm. I'm going to start working myself around the kid a little bit. Like I've said before, I like using these big sticks just to warm up with because when you take the big sticks away, you put your regular sticks in your hand, you fly. I always suggest to young drummers, keep the leg weights on and keep them on for as long as you can. Do this little exercise. This is a great, this is what I always tell everybody to start. Do this little exercise, the double strokes with the single strokes. So there you go. See you in a minute.
This here is Unsinger by Mechanism. This was the very first song I learned by these guys. It's also their simplest, I think. Don't have to do too much crazy counting in this. Here's an example of some of that staggered double bass that I like to play. I thought that part right there kind of sits with the bass really nice. Coming up is an example, I'm about to start right here. This is an example of me doing double strokes in the middle of a single stroke pattern. Right there is a double stroke coming up right here. Double stroke on the right kick. Here's an example, check it out. Right there. Just a simple and effective way to get that extra note in there. If you notice, the, the kick drums are following what the riff is doing. Which is the style that I pretty much invented back in Dark Angel. If you notice, I'm using my left foot as the main kick drum on that, mainly so I can get that hi-hat to open and close. Notice left foot and hi-hat on kick drum, and hi-hat. Right here is an example of where I'm probably staring at the blip there. Anytime I'm staring off into space, I'm usually staring at the blip on the triggers. I'll explain that later. Part of my style comes from, since I did not ever take a lesson, I learned how to play drums through osmosis. I used to sit there with my record player and my gargantuan air drum kit and I don't know if it's something I've just had a natural capacity for or, it, or what, but I've always been able to pick out the drum parts, you know? When you hear somebody doing a cover song, like say something like Rush, for instance, Neil Peart being the godly accomplished drummer that he is, you see somebody playing a Rush song and if you're gonna play a Rush song, you're gonna wanna do that song note for note, like just perfectly, just like Neil Peart. And that was one thing that I picked up on really early. You know, he was a huge influence, definitely in my air drumming days, to where you know, I could play entire Rush songs, note for note, just by air drumming them. You take those sticks and you put yourself in front of a kit, and playing the kit is just as easy as playing the air drums. A good way to listen, like say if you're, if you're listening to this crazy pattern that you're just like, wow, I don't know, I don't know what the hell is this guy's doing here. It's just a pile of crazy drumming. 
you know, usually they're pretty regimented, you know, it's not all as fleet free flow as you might think. You break it down, listen to what the guy's kick drum is doing. Then you listen to what his hi-hat's doing and his snare, where he's putting his snare. And that's where, you know, you've just given yourself a drum lesson by breaking down one of your favorite drum songs and listening to everything he does. And by listening, I, you know, I was able to work on my memory tons. That's the great thing that playing a song like, say, like Tom Sawyer by Rush, not a proficiently technical song by any means, but Neil Peart is so tasty in what he does, you know, I like he likes to lead into every chorus by playing a different fill than the last one. He likes to build it up. I've always tried to do that. That's definitely a Neil Peart influence. If I'm going to play something with three choruses in it, chances are I'm going to build up each little fill until the next one. And that was just by learning through osmosis, you know. All my fills are stolen. You know, Dom Famularo told me 12, 13 years ago, he's like, you know, steal, you know, and expect to be stolen from. I've always said I've stolen most of my licks. You know, I, I'll, I'll cite influences. I'll cite where I stole this one from. You know, people will sit and listen to my records that I do with me, asking me, where'd that one come from? Where'd this one come from? Where'd you get that one from? And for the most part, I probably got them from somebody else, you know, just because that's the way I learned was through osmosis and I listened. You know, I'm not much of a solo doer. Any band I play with, the entire set is a solo anyway, so this is just kind of a nutty little beat that I've been working on for a little while. It just feels really good to play. Here's an example of me doing the open and closed hi-hat as I'm doing the double kicks, like right here, for instance. I just like the drone of it. Like, here's an example of where I love it. I love the way the drums sound. Like that tom right there, for instance, the floor tom. They just have this nice little hum to them that. I play off the music so much. I play off what the drums are sounding like so much. rocking it a little faster now that I've warmed it up a little bit. It's really nice to play this. I love using all of the drum when I play. You know, I do a lot of rim shots on the on the toms, not just the snare. You can see where I'm attacking the head. I'm hitting, I'm hitting a lot of rim on this. I've really worked none of this solo out at all, like, so it's just me pretty much just freaking out, blissing out with the eyes closed, and dropping the stick. Now I'm going to play you Hall of the Gods by Mechanism. This song, Hall of the Gods, is probably our uh, most power metal song, maybe, or something. It definitely has a lot of groove to it. 
This is an example of accenting some blast beats. This part isn't really a blast beat, it's more of a just a straight part with a couple of pickup notes on the snare. Here's where I augment that first part a little bit. It's not quite the same as what I played the first time, but this right here is. It's kind of a Neil Pert trying to stagger something a little bit. I wrote the drums to this the first time I ever heard it. Chris, the guitarist, played me the entire song. He's like, I got an idea for this. I just wrote it on the weekend. Every beat I came up with right on the spot was the one that we used. Notice I'm, tr I'm not really, I'm trying to stagger the kick drums there. Kind of make it sound like a triplet feel as opposed to a uh, just straight time feel. There's a trick I use a lot, playing the ride bell and the, and the china. It gives the china an off-time feel. I like it. thing I've always liked doing is if I can play two chinas at a time, I'll do it. I like using, you know, unison on things. It just makes the chinas twice as loud. You got a double tone coming off it. If you can play something with two hands, why not? Because it just makes it cooler than playing it with one. Plus here's some pretty haul and double kicks here. I took the leg weights off for this song, and it was really for that part right there. I'm changing the pattern twice here. It augments to the second. I play that part in the second verse, and I play this part only here. A little triplet action there. I recorded this album with no click track, and trying to play these songs you know, it's been a while since I've tracked this. Um, this project has been in, in mind for quite some time now, so I tracked these these tracks quite a while ago, and it makes it interesting to play with just a guitar, no click track. It's not as tight as it would be if I had, you know, had used the click track. But at the time, we had no time to record this. It was. I recorded all the tracks for this album in five hours, and it was the day after we got home from a strapping shoot, and then we had a strapping video shoot to do like the next day after I recorded the original tracks for this. Here's an example of me, if you notice, I'm moving back and forth on the pedals. 
And right here, I'm definitely digging my toes in. I'm curling the hell out of them. You see, I just kind of kick that left foot into it. It moves back, it moves front, it moves forth. And you see, I'm just staring at the blip right now, slave to the blip. I don't move my legs very much when I play. They barely move. It's mostly my ankle, and that's due to the ankle weights. I got a lot of strength coming out of my ankle. As a matter of fact, Chris, the guitarist of Mechanism, was telling me when we were rehearsing this project, we were using a borrowed drum set because I think my, I forget why, but we were, record, we were rehearsing at a friend's place. That friend has a really demonstrative style, lots of arms, lots of legs, lots of wild motion. And he said that, I played with that guy so long and he looks like he's beating the hell out of his drums, but they never move. You sat on it one time and you do whatever little you do and that kit was moving all across the floor there and that kind of taught me how much you actually do and utilize that power out of your strength. When I play beats, when I'm playing like a thrash metal beat or something like that, uh, period, I like to keep my snare pretty flat because I love rim shots. Yeah, that's pretty much how I get the big crack out of the snare. I think that's how you do get the crack out of the snare. A lot of drummers, they have that super angled snare and they tend to hit like, it's like they're grazing the snare and I never understand that because it's like you got this big fat ugly rim there that just sounds so cool. Like here's how it sounds normally. Sounds like a snare. Nice snare, whatever. But this is like... <laughs> whack the hell out of it, and you get that rim shot in there, you get a good crack, it just sounds so cool. It sounds way better than just hitting like that. It just sounds boring to me, man. Slam some, slam some rim shot in there. Get some rim in there, and you really rock, you know? So there you go. work on a little beat that I like to play. I like to play this for a while, so. But this is a total Bill Bruford influence. Using the tom as something to ride upon. I'm just keeping the, the kicks are doing a double stroke on the right kick and a single stroke on the left. I'm hitting the kick along with the hi-hat. And I'm just doing a kind of a gallop. Here's a little Terry Bozio. Presto Vivace by UK. Not done very well, but I was just making stuff up.
I've always liked being able to, you know, play the double kick with the hi-hat kind of bouncing up and down and you make the hi-hat do all sorts of crazy, crazy things when you got it going up and down along with the other kick. example of throwing the drums down the stairs. I've always referred to this as my default lick. Because this is like the easiest stuff in the world to do. I love hearing all the tones that drums can make. I can see my eyes are closed, which is pretty usual when I'm playing stuff like this. I just like zen and out, man. I'm, like, I'm not even thinking about anything when I'm playing out here. I'm definitely not thinking about the next part, because there isn't one. Like here, total breakdown. Shut it down. All right, the way I hold my sticks is I pretty much hold them about like that. That's about the only area of the stick that touches my hand. I believe that's called the fulcrum area. And I use a lot of fingers when I play, a lot of bounce. I use a lot of wrist, you know, like if I'm, if I'm playing, like I, I can do that a lot. You know, my wrist doesn't move a lot. A lot of times I do use my wrist. And I choke up, I move them around, I keep them really supple in my hands. They move all over the place. Like, I'll even play like that sometimes. Here's, this is about what they do when I'm playing. It's constantly working. I love the way the sticks feel. It gives you a different tone. I love working with the tone of the drums. That's why I play a lot of rim shots on everything. And by moving them around, you can just get really cool tone out of the sticks. I think sticks totally have tone. Like, I can play a stick, and if it's broken, I can tell you right off the bat if, it's, if there's something wrong with it or whatever. It's just years of playing, I guess. But here's an example of moving them all around and uh, just kind of working around a little bit. They're moving all over the place when I'm playing there. And uh, yeah, so there you go. There's that. I recorded this album with four Chinas and not a lot of ride symbols, so I had to kind of compensate on this DVD for, I usually don't throw a china up right there, but on this one I thought it suited the purpose, so I did. I refer to this as the Madonna beat, because it kind of comes out of a song called Oh Father by Madonna. She didn't throw any glass beats in her thing, though. I kept all these songs instrumental because we're giving, you know, we're playing five songs on here and I didn't want to give half the record away by putting vocals on it. And, uh, so I kept these instrumental. Val did a great job on the vocals. one of the few moments of actual groove on the record.
I like this ghost tone right here. It just has a nice little flow to it. Here's a little freestyle solo. It's a little bit of a shuffle for you. It's my favorite shuffle. It's kind of an augmentation of the Purdy Shuffle by Bernard Purdy, and it's my favorite shuffle to play, and I just wanted to put it on here and show you a little bit of groove and taste. I put this little ditty on here merely as an example of uh, playing some of the non-metal stuff. I guess it's one of my favorite beats. I love this. I love shuffles. And it shows you just a little bit of the, the ghost notey snare play. And this is probably a version of the Purdy shuffle. Bernard Purdy is the person who probably created this, and he's a great drummer, and he's played, he's played on tons of stuff, you know, like Steely Dan albums and stuff, and he's got a great style, and I could never imitate him because he's got so much feel, but I'll try to get something a little groovy. I think this shows a pretty good example of using your, your, the feel of your left hand. As well as grooving it with your right. Like here's some reeling in the years by Steely Dan, kind of, which Bernard Purdy plays on. augmentation of let's say hot for teacher or something like that. It's not hot for teacher at all, but kind of recalls, brings to mind that. Now I'm gonna funk it up a little bit and stink up the joint with a little bit of funky flavor here. I love funk, I love playing funk, and if I'm not playing metal, chances are I'm gonna be playing funk. Funk it up. Stink. Go. I think this is a beat that I probably glommed right off a of James Brown record. Hands of the funky drummer. When I'm goofing around on my kit, boy, I'm playing stuff like this way more than hauling double bass patterns anymore. I've always loved drummers like Sonny Emery who can make the drum set sing and talk. Here's an example of just trying to get it to talk. Let's, let's speak a different language with it than it normally speaks. 
normally my drum set is yelling at you. Trying to work the sticks around, just trying to find the tone that I like. You know, I do tend to think that a lot of times, you know, double bass is kind of taboo in when playing a funky beat, but this is one of the more funky double bass beats you can create while you're playing some some funk. I love Chad Sexton from 311 as a drummer. I think he's an amazing funky drummer. He's a funky white dude, that guy is, and he uses a lot of double bass in his patterns, in his funky patterns. He's a big influence on my taste. One of my new favorite drummers is a drummer named Stanton Moore. And I think he definitely has, you know, he's a funky white dude too. Some of the old death days with this sort of stuff right here, playing on double ride action. None of these solos are really the tightest things because I tell you, I didn't really work on them that much. I didn't really rehearse any drum solos for this. I kind of worked out a little basic part and kind of just figured, all right, just freak out on the thing. And I'm not a, I'm not a great come up with stuff right off the top of your head sort of thing, I think. Well, I can do it all right. Here's a good one. Just to go freak out, Gene. Come up with something cool. And of this, I think probably, you know, 40% of this is pretty decent. You know, the other, the other 60% is stuff I probably chop out, but I put the whole thing on this just to show you what a warts and all session of goofing around would be. We could have edited this out to be like two minutes of really cool stuff, but I just figured, no, I'm, I'm a human, man, to show the whole thing. I'm trying to come up with a big old exciting ending here. reminds me of old school drum solos, just all those solos you'd see in the 80s and stuff. I really like whacking that first rack tom and just getting some nice tone out of it. There's my Brufordism that's coming through. And then the old standard, throwing the drums down the stairs. Right here is a tune called Psycho from Jilly C, and it's got a lot of nice little groove to it, nice little funky flavor to it, so I figured I'd throw it on here. Enjoy! This tune is called Psycho, and it's by my friend Jilly C in Chicago, and uh, she's kind of a pop artist, and I think this is an example, and I wanted to put this song right here, because it's an example of playing with a little bit of taste, a little bit of feel, a little bit of groove, a little bit of funk. I like the song a lot. I love the bass line in it. I just played with the bass line as much as I could. I tried to 
stuff like this might be boring to watch, but it's a ton of fun to play because you, know, you just get to lock in with the click. And you get to make it feel really nice. Joey Kramer esque riding right here. Did you really think it would make him take you back? You say you got a bun in the oven because of unprotected love, and now we couldn't possibly leave you except it's not true. And when he finds out, what do you think he'll do? Is it better late? As of the time of this filming, this song is unreleased. I'm sure it's going to get a release sometime in the near future. I think Jilly C has a lot of talent and a lot of uh, potential to become really big. So, hell, I, if I, I might just quit playing metal altogether and just start playing stuff with her because I'm sure love is a lot of fun. She's got that vanilla ice cream tasting butt, I bet, too. So unprofessional. Right here is kind of my little attempt at some Stanton Moore-esque playing, some New Orleans second line drumming. Very poor attempt, but I'm trying. Like, all I'm doing here is just making stuff up. Like I just, I didn't expect to even be playing this right now when I was tracking it, like when we were filming this. So all of this is just completely off the top of my head, which, which is cool. This is just a nice little ad-lib funk freak out. This kind of shows you a little bit of that, that funk stuff that I was doing earlier, I guess. Next up is a song from my brother in corpulence, Mr. Plow, and the song is called Biscuits and Gravy. Righteous. I like playing on his, song, on his albums because they're fun. I can usually do eight or nine songs a day with him. It takes about three or four hours to record. And this is just a really fun song. I love playing with him. This song has Norwood Fisher from Fishbone on bass, as well as Rocky George from Suicidal Tendencies, also Fishbone, on guitar. But it's a lot of fun to play his stuff, and, you know, it's just total puerile porno lyrics, but the, the music is fun. This is a fun project for me. And I like Mr. Plow a lot. I think he's really cool. And plus, the fact they get to play with Norwood and Rocky, that's pretty damn cool, if you ask me. I just tried to play this really swampy groove to this. I mean, it totally plays off the beat. It's not on the beat at all. It's really wacky, and I love Nor Norwood's bass line on this. As you can tell, Mr. Plow is probably the most accomplished and best singer I've ever worked with. <laughs> I love Plow, he's awesome, he's a great guy to work with. I just like the way this song sits, man, it's just there's no real, like, where's the one? It's 
a slow beat, slow groove, but like, where's the one on this? And when we recorded this, I wrote the drums, you know, literally right before we recorded it. So I just tried to see, I just, you know, I was playing, and Norwood was not present when we recorded the drum tracks for this shit. I just really kind of thought, what's something I could lay down where he could lay a big, fat, storming bass line down? And I think he did a good job on it. I like this line right here. I don't care for that fucking band for you. Yeah. The actual album version is a little bit different because I'm screwing it up drastically right here. It's supposed to kick into a nice big upbeat, which I didn't do, but that's alright. I'm sure there's a MrPlow.com out there or something. You can check out all his material. You can MySpace him. A lot of fun. I like that stuff. Now I'm going to show you an example of what I call a blast beat. I know there's tons of monikers for them, blast, grind, gravity blast, all that sort of stuff. I don't really know what any of them are called. This is what I refer to as a blast beat. And here's an example where I don't do a lot of rim shots, but I do like to kind of work them in. I like to work around the snare as I blast beat. And it's, it's pretty cool because I love the tone of the snare. If you start working your snare over to the rim, As you're blasting, it just makes this really crazy tone that just kind of works really well with, with what the music is playing. Like if the music kind of kicks up a notch, crank it over to the right. But here's an example of what I do. I like to pound really hard. You know, I like to really lay into the blast beat. There are a lot of guys out there that like to just tap and flutter, and I never understand that. So I like to lay into it. So here you go. Here's an example. All right, as you can tell, I like to bounce around quite a bit when I'm doing blasts. Uh, I like to accent with what the guitars are doing or whatever the accent of the song is. I like to lay one down in there with it because that's a bla straight blast beat is really cool. It's just like pounding and solid. But if you could add a little taste into it, you know, I'm, I love taste. You know, like I've said all this time, I'm all about taste, you know, in, in the metal context anyway. So if you flutter around quite a bit, it can, you know, That's a really tasty blast beat. Another thing I like to do when I'm doing blast beats is a lot of guys, I can't really do the single footed blast like a lot of guys do, I'm really lazy. So instead of being as lazy as I like to be, which would just be basically this. I'll mix it up a bit by throwing in some crazy double bass patterns. Like I really like feeling like a marching sort of feel on the kick drums as you're, as you're blasting up top and you got some crazy fluttery kick action sort of going on the bottom. So let me show you an example of that. That beat right there has been dubbed by, uh, by Mr. Barker and Loriano as the Hoagland Blast. I didn't even know I created a blast. That's pretty cool, but those guys were telling me, yeah, that double crazy bass stuff that you do while you're doing blast beats, we call that the Hoagland Blast. So I'm pretty cool for that. That's awesome.
One thing I like to do when I'm, when I'm playing double kicks is I'm more or less an, a left, right, alternating drummer. I do use a lot of double strokes on the right kick drum to get that kind of gallop effect, you know, delit, 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 rather than going, uh, since I'm a left-footed lead on most parts, you know, most people are right-footed leads. When I got my first kit, it was a single bass kit, and I would have to kind of fake the double bass. So before I learned how to do that by playing, you know, with one foot, lead with your hi-hat, and then, you know, alternating 16th notes, start with your hi-hat, and, you know, and have alternate between your, your hi-hat and your, and your right kick. When I'm playing alternating 16th notes or 32nd notes, I'm a left-footed lead. So what I like to do is I like to crank my left foot, crank it at a bit of an angle, and rest my foot on the hi-hat. Because you figure that just makes a crazier tone anyway, you know, like if you're playing an opening and closing a hi-hat while you're playing this kind of technical double kick pattern, you can you could really mess it up really good, you know. That's a, that's a really good way to, to just make it sound like you're an octopus. And any time I've ever played drums to somebody's project where they wrote the drums, they, 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 a lot of times I'll get entire, you know, I'll get an entire disc of completed material. They, they programmed everything on the drums, but they kept it just kind of simple. They gave it to me. I play their beats, but I kind of genize things. A lot of times, people who program drums, they're guitarists. They don't understand that you know a drummer only has four limbs, and you can hear t you can hear things where it's like, wow, I would need three arms and four legs to play that. If I get something like that in the mail where it sounds really technical and impossible to play, damn right, I'm going to play that. And so, a lot of the, a lot of the reason why I do the double bass and the crazy octopus style that I've got is from playing, trying to, trying to capture what somebody else's vision is when they program some wacky drum part. Here's an example of just some fragmented double bass. I suppose I could play all of this stuff a whole lot faster. Like this part to me is really boring, but like I'm I'm just trying to find a groove right here. Ah, oh, here it comes. An example possibly of the Hoagland blast I mentioned earlier. Trying to accent a little bit with the snare. Right here, I suppose, would be in the rainy season from strapping. It's kind of one of the beats I play from that. Yeah, obviously I took the leg weights off of this one. But I, like I was saying earlier, I could probably play this a whole lot faster, but I figured, I'm, I, you know, since I don't know what I'm doing in this solo yet, I'm literally just making everything up as I go. So, yeah, here's an example of my hi-hat going up and down with the, the kick. See the hi-hat moving there? I like doing that. You usually have to play an offbeat on the hi-hat to make it sound cool on this, which I'm not doing because I'm not cool. I like that ghost note. -y. A little tasty action.
kind of my move to do that double stroke on the right foot and keep the left foot a single to complete the gallop. Right here, I'm kind of putting this part in as a tribute to the old death era, which is also could be wrong side from Strathen. Trying to figure out where the hell I'm going with this thing right now. One thing I've always tried to concentrate on, when I'm hitting the tom, no matter if I'm playing fast or slow or whatever, I've always tried to to concentrate on getting my, like when I'm actually playing a fill, nailing the center of the tom. You know, if it's not a part where I'm hitting the rim for any reason, because like I said a million times before, I like to hit the rims a lot. I like to do rim shots on the toms. I've always thought that's a cool sound. But when I'm actually hitting the toms, I aim as close to the center as I can. Some actual Holland. I want to be inspirational in terms of like, if I can do it, anybody can do it. If I can do this, you can do this. Exactly. Extremely. That's, that's, that's a done deal in my head. If I can do it, you can do it. Keep at it. You know, all, all you drummers out there are going to be really amazing, you know, because you're watching this DVD and I'm teaching you everything. I'm teaching you all my tricks. Hell yeah. It's going to be awesome. Anytime I do a song like this, like this song, this this part might be re reminiscent of uh, what is that song? Out of Touch by Death, Ooh, off the Individual Thought Patterns record. Anytime I play songs like this, the biggest influence for me is Alex Van Halen on the song Tora Tora, because I like that whole song. And here's one of the crazier blast beats I've ever done. Pretty wacky part. I think this is probably the very first time I've ever done it correctly. This part right here has a crazy alternating pattern. Alternate left, alternate right. Each part, your foot ends up playing backwards from the other foot. I had to work really hard to keep this song from sounding like Out of Touch by Death because Out of Touch by Death is just directly Tora Tora. Here's an example of how I learned how to count to well, some crazy number right here. It's really hard. Let me try to count this as we go. It's a really weird one. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What kind of counting is that? I just counted to 21 or something. That's retarded. Way to go, guys. But that, that is an example of where I count. That fill I just played, I refer to as a Paul Bostaff fill because it reminds me of Paul Bostaff. And on the record, it definitely, I, I played it all weird on this one, but on the album, when the album comes out, you'll hear it. I played it a lot better. Yeah, 
Yeah, when I play drums, I like it when orange strings come out of my head. I've gotten to the point where most of this material is kind of feel. You know, when I first started playing this mechanism stuff, it was a whole lot of counting for me. And like I said, as a drummer, I'm not really used to doing that. I like to feel things, and most stuff I work with is within the parameters of, let's say, a 4-4 four, four time. A lot of this stuff is so weird and so off that it's interesting to have to count. Like this part right here is a 13. That's 23 right there. Crazy. It's awesome. All right, everybody. Well, I guess that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this. And tell you what, I will probably see you at a clinic real soon. If you want, come up and say, hey, I'm usually pretty cool. So hope you enjoyed it. And rock on, man. Keep playing. Keep those double bass chops going. We'll catch you guys soon. We'll see you. Metal.